Well, good morning once again, and let me add my welcome. My name is Matt. I'm one of the pastors here at the church. It's great to be here with you again as we continue our series through the book of Revelation. You know, Christians are supposed to be witnesses to Jesus. That's what Jesus says in Acts chapter 1. He said, uh, you will receive power when the Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. But what does it mean to be a witness to Jesus? You know, while I don't ever remember a day in my life that I didn't profess faith in Jesus, uh, there was a moment in high school, a time in my life, when I had a real uh, conversion or awakening experience. And all of a sudden, Jesus as Savior was incredibly real to me. His word came alive in my life. And along with that, there was this urgency to do what Jesus tells us to do and to be a witness to him. Uh, but this was a really difficult and stressful thing to do as a high schooler in a secular high school of over 3,000 people. So I would pray for boldness and I would try to think about some ways to talk about Jesus with people and I had some very awkward conversations as you can imagine if you've ever talked to me. Um, but I just couldn't bring myself to, to, to stand up on the balcony in the main hall and tell everyone about Jesus and I really felt like that's what I was supposed to do. So I was stumped as to how to witness to Jesus, to tell everyone about him. And so I, I started doing this weird thing, uh, and I uh, started writing my own little gospel tracts and folding them up like a high schooler folds up a love note. And, and, and then I would, in crowded hallways, uh, when it looked like no one was kind of had their eye on me, I'd drop them in the hallway. And, and I was hoping that, hey, even if I don't have the boldness to stand up and, and witness in the way I think I should, maybe, maybe this is a way I can uh, tell people about Jesus, to, a to, to ask them if they know him as their personal savior. Um, I did some other weird things to try to obey Jesus and be a witness. Uh, I remember joining up on uh, many Friday nights with some Christian friends I had met who were uh, into hip hop and were actually uh, aspiring rappers. And uh, we would go to uh, the street by the local state university and um, all the bars are there and party goers everywhere. And uh, we would stand out on the street and, and we had a boombox backpack and we would uh, freestyle rap about Jesus. And, and sometimes, I, I wasn't very good, it was, I, I mostly let the other guys do it. Um, but sometimes uh, there would be these other people that would come and, and try to battle them. And uh, what, what my friends would do is they would, uh, they would do a rap battle, but instead of tearing the other person down, they'd, they'd build them up. And, and so this was another kind of way we were trying to witness to Jesus, just to try to figure out any way, how do we do this thing and tell people about Jesus? And I look back at these, these things, and, and I have a sense of admiration uh, for the, the zeal and the dedication uh, to tell people about Christ, to be a witness. But what I also see is that there was... Uh, a real sense of, of desperation, and that we had, uh, of, that I and, and my friends who were Christians had a really narrow sense of what it meant to be a witness to Jesus and how to do that. And it was a view that didn't seem to show a lot of fruit uh, most of the time, and it, it was something that we couldn't carry with us into our adult lives or uh, professional lives or different places that we would go. Uh, I'm guessing that a lot of you have never done the kind of weird things that I tried to do to be a witness, but you can probably identify with this sense of tension, a desire to do what Jesus has told us to do and, and, and tell people about uh, the wonderful news of Christ, but then also uh, not knowing what it means to be a witness, not knowing how that happens. So the question is, what does it mean to be a witness? And a lot of you have jobs uh, where you can't talk about your faith openly. Um, a lot of you know um, that, you know, struggle to know how to witness to people in your family or to share the love of Christ with your neighbors and friends. And so what we want to do today is answer this question of how to be a witness by looking at Revelation 11 and a little bit back in Revelation 10. And we're going to look at this question, how to be a witness. Now, there's so much 
in chapter 11. There's so much to the book of Revelation, but I want to just focus us here on that theme of witness this morning. So uh, the text is going to help us see this progression of these, these key factors of what it means for us to be a witness in our lives. And um, no matter what your calling are or your particular giftings, uh, these three things are central to us as individuals and as a church in bearing witness to Jesus. And so those th three things are truth, trampling, and triumph. All witness progresses through truth, trampling, and triumph. Uh, before we get into it, let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for your word which feeds us. We pray that it would go deep into our hearts, that we would become embodiments of your word. Help us, Lord, to be filled with the power of your spirit and to be witnesses of your coming kingdom. Bless us now as we hear the word, read, taught. Help us to read and mark and inwardly digest it. In the name of Christ, amen. So first, truth. To be a witness, we must embody the truth. Uh, let me just broadly orient you to where we are in coming to Revelation chapter 11. We're coming to the end of a section, the first half of the book of Revelation. And it is a distinct unit uh, for all of the things that we've seen in here, seven letters to seven churches, uh, the throne room of God, seven seals, and now we're in the middle of seven trumpets. Um, there is a through line through these 11 uh, chapters, and what that is is that we are witnessing a big, giant commissioning service of the Apostle John as a prophet. Um, there are a lot of parallels in throughout Revelation 1 to 11 to the commissioning service of the prophet Ezekiel in the first five chapters of that Old Testament book. So John is being commissioned to be a prophet or to be one who bears witness to the truth. And as we near the end of this commissioning service, uh, back at the end of chapter 10, or, or the beginning of chapter 10, pardon me, this, John sees this angel descending from heaven, and he hears the thundering voice of God speaking to him. And what he does in verse 4 is he, he takes a pen, and he dutifully starts to write down what he hears the voice saying to him. And then an interesting thing happens. God says, stop, don't write that down, seal up the book. And then God tells him to do something else. He says, do you see the angel? And he's holding a scroll or a book in his hand. I want you to go take and eat that book. It will be sweet in your mouth, but bitter in your stomach. Sweet as honey in your mouth. In other words, what we see is John at the height of this commissioning service, at the climax of it, he's being told, my witness, to witness to me, the Lord says, is not just to transmit words or abstract truths. It does involve that, but it's about much more than that. It's about ingesting the truth in yourself. It's about consuming it, getting it into you so that you yourself become an embodiment of the truth of divine revelation. And the Lord Jesus, or, or the voice of God tells him, it's going to be a process that is both sweet, comforting, and also bitter, challenging, and confronting. And the Lord, what the Lord wants here is for God's word, the truth, to do deep work within John before he sends him out to be a witness. God is saying, you are what you eat, so eat my word, eat the truth. So you have to absorb the truth of the book and let it become embodied within your life. What does that look like? Last year, uh, a friend, uh, a former reser actually contacted me from afar and said, hey, I wanna buy you tickets to this thing that's going on at the, um, at the Kennedy Center. And it was something Shakespeare, and I thought that sounds good, and, and I didn't, I, I, to my shame, I honestly didn't like pay as much attention to what they had said. They were buying me tickets. I was busy. And then the day came to go. And so I show up at the Kennedy Center. Um, I grabbed a friend uh, from the church, Micah Harris. And we went there. And I had no idea what I was showing up to. I knew it had something to do with Shakespeare. And, um, I, but the, someone bought me tickets, and I couldn't let them go to waste. So I, I went. And 
uh, I show up and it's Shakespeare, the, the improvised Shakespeare is what it was called. And um, I show up and it's these four dudes dressed up in pseudo Shakespearean garb and a very minimalistic set, uh, black background. And they start out by asking the audience uh, for a title for the play of that evening. And so someone from the audience shouts out, uh, Around the Town of Ducks. And so they say, okay, our, our play tonight is Around the Town of Ducks. And then they go into character and they spend 90 minutes and they, they do this sh improvised Shakespearean play with characters uh, of Scrooge McDuck and his three nephews, Huey, Dewey, and Louie, and then some others that they introduce along the way. And it's all done in this, this sort of faux Shakespearean English. And it was hilarious. But the thing that really impressed me is how perfectly, within these 90 minutes, they brought in all the elements of Shakespearean tragedy. All the character de development, the tension, the climax, the resolution, anything a, a, a character or one of the actors introduced, the others were able to enfold into this play that was just phenomenal. And you realized as you watched it, these people have had to completely absorb the works of Shakespeare to do this. And I was thinking that that's a lot like what happens in the Christian life. Um, the reality is the Christian life and, and what we're supposed to do and how we bear witness, it isn't scripted for us in the scripture. The Bible doesn't directly address the myriad of unique situations that we face and different cultural elements uh, in, in every culture, but what we know is that if you absorb the Bible, the truth of the Bible, you gain the ability to improvise and embody truth in a way that's faithful, and you become a witness of that reality in the place and time that God has called us. And, and this is so important for us to think about because the essential element of being a witness to the truth is embodying the truth. The vast majority of the people around us, whether it's our children, our neighbors, family members and coworkers, they will not come to faith in Jesus because we make a persuasive, cogent argument, philosophical argument for the truth of Christ's resurrection or uh, the existence of God or anything like that. Uh, those things are important and they have their place in confirming and building up faith. But the reality is, is that people generally come to know and believe the truth by encountering the truth embodied in a Christian person and in Christian community. And so we ourselves are to be the apologetic that displays the truth to people. So that's the first thing about being a witness. You want to be a witness Begin to absorb the truth of the gospel in your life to where it becomes part of you and you begin to embody it. So truth. Now, what does it mean to embody the truth and be a witness specifically? It brings us to the second thing I want you to see, the second element of witness, trampling. To be a witness requires willing to be trampled for the sake of the truth. It means making yourself vulnerable to those who need to know about Christ and his kingdom, trampling. Uh, when we get to chapter 11, verse one, John is given a reed, it's a measuring rod, and he's told to go and measure the heavenly temple and the altar and, and to mark it off as a holy city. He's measuring this space off and, and everything outside of it by virtue of that mes measuring is uh, not holy. And John is told in, in verse two that what is outside of this holy city, what is outside of this boundary of temple and altar and city is going to be this unholy section. Everything else is going to be allowed to trample the holy city and its temple and its altar. He says that it will be trampled for 42 months. And, and then in verse 3, he says that there will be two witnesses who will prophesy within the trampled city for 1,260 days. Again, that's three and a half years, but expressed differently. What's going on here? There's a lot, but three and a half is a symbolic number. It's half of a week, 
half of the complete number that is seven. And what's being said here is that God will give this holy city, which symbolizes the church, and the two witnesses who bring the witness to the world, these two witnesses who symbolize Jew and Gentile, that God will give them over to both Jew and Gentile to be trampled for a time, but not completely and not forever. The outside unholy world comes against them in darkness. 42 months is three and a half years reckoned by the, uh, the moon. And the witnesses will bear witness to the light for that period of time. 1260 days is three and a half years reckoned by the sun. And all that to say, what we're seeing here is that to be a witness is ultimately to be vulnerable to trampling. In verses four and five, we see that these witnesses, they have fire coming out of their mouths. Like the prophet Jeremiah, the word of God within them becomes a fire and, and they have tremendous power to do all sorts of things, the text tells us. But at the same time, eventually these witnesses in verses seven to nine show us that they are, they're killed and their bodies lay in the street for three and a half days. They are killed, we're told, in the city, not the holy city that's above, but the holy city uh, that was Jerusalem, the city where Christ was crucified. And both those who dwell on the land, the text says, meaning the Jewish people who live in the land, and those who are the tribes and tongues and nations, the Gentiles, will celebrate over their death. And there's so much complicated imagery here. I want to stop, but the, the overall message is clear. To be a witness, to embody the truth of the gospel, is to go out into the world willing to be trampled for embodying that truth. Everyone who witnesses to the truth of Jesus, everyone who seeks to embody that in their lives, is going to suffer. The truth of the gospel is offensive to people. It makes a claim of God's lordship on their lives. It calls out idolatry and sin, and it calls people to repentance and to submit to and worship the Lord Jesus Christ. And inevitably, this provokes a reaction. People hate this message, and they come to hate its messengers. And the reason that Scripture includes this as part of this commissioning is because we're being prepared here with John for a life of witness, of embodying the truth and being ready for the trampling that often comes with it. In Greek, the word witness is martyreo, or the word from which we get our word martyr. And the ultimate way that the church embodies the truth as a witness is by giving over its body to be trampled in death and suffering. The ultimate witness, the fulfillment of witness, the consummation of witness is martyrdom. The ultimate way that we embody the truth of Jesus is by our bodies being joined to his body as he suffers peaceably at the hands of his enemies. You know, I really need to hear this. I'm a a fighter. Um, I want to stand up for the truth, but when someone stands against it uh, or stands against me as a messenger of the truth, I want to fight back. I have sometimes joked that I have the spiritual gift of standing up to bullies. But this is not the way Jesus shows us in the Gospels. And it's not what I'm called to as his follower. So I'm convicted by this as I think about this concept of martyrdom. Instead, I'm called to embody a love for enemies, enemies of the truth, enemies of myself, even to the point of allowing myself to be vulnerable to their trampling. And I wanna be careful in saying this. Um, You know, if you're in an abusive situation or facing harm, you know, uh, get out. Do so. Uh, The apostles, when you see in the book of Acts, they ran from harm whenever they could without compromising the truth. But when it came to embodying the truth to the world, they were willing to make themselves vulnerable 
to shame, to humiliation, to embarrassment, to other people getting the best of them, and ultimately even to death when it came down to it. And I really think this message, this focus on martyrdom, is a witness that we as a church in our day and age need to hear. It seems to me that so much of our concern as we look out at the world is how we can hold on to power through legal or political or other means. And these things are, are okay insofar as they go. But sometimes collectively we're doing it at the expense of loving our enemies, of making ourselves vulnerable to trampling in order to do so. So to be a witness is to make yourself vulnerable, to divest of power, to bear witness to the truth in a way that makes you vulnerable to trampling. So that's trampling. But why does Jesus want us to be vulnerable to trampling, to embrace the idea that the martyrs are the ones to emulate? Well, that brings us to the final element in the progression of bearing witness, triumph. It's through our embodiment of truth to the point of trampling that we ultimately triumph. The blood of the martyrs, Tertullian said, is the seed of the church. We overcome in being overcome. That is the path of triumph. The two witnesses here in chapter 11, they're trampled down in the streets for three and a half days. This both marks out the fact that their trampling is is only for a time, and it connects their deaths to the death of Jesus Christ himself, who was in the tomb for three days. At the end of the three days in verses 11 and 12, uh, they're resurrected and they're, they're called into heaven, and their enemies look on with fear and trembling. This is one part of this great triumph that they have. As their bodies are joined to the body of Jesus in death, they are also joined with him in the triumph of resurrection. That's one side of the triumph. But there's another aspect of triumph here that we're supposed to see. And that is the triumph that happens in Revelation 11:13, 13, wherein some of those who put them to death are then converted and turned to faith in Christ. Let me read that verse for you. At that hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. A tenth, a tithe of the city falls. There's death and destruction, but there are many who turn in the fear of God, to worship him. As these witnesses have embodied the truth, even to the point of trampling, some of the ungodly and unholy outsiders are moved to repentance and worship of God. Even though their initial reaction was to kill the witnesses, now when their witness is sealed with their blood, these, these outsiders are moved to enter into the progression of witness themselves. See, in the past weeks, we've been reading through these trumpet blasts. And as God sends plagues of judgment down on the world that resists his church, uh, these are due punishments. But none of them result in conversion. It's only when we get to this sixth trumpet where the witness of the martyrs, the people of God, lay down their lives, even for their enemies, that people are won over to the worship of God. We triumph ultimately through embodying the truth to the point of being trampled. The most convincing embodiment of the truth, the most convincing apologetic, is a life that makes no sense from the world's calculation a life of self-giving love, even for those who want to destroy us. And that's the paradox of how God brings about the church's ultimate triumph and brings more and more people to come to know and love his son. 
Peter Lightheart puts it like this, saints overcome when they bear witness and when they do not love their life even to death. We overcome in being overcome, just the path of victory we should expect if we are called to follow the crucified. We overcome in being overcome. That's the path of triumph. In closing, let me refer you to the end of chapter 11. The seventh and final trumpet sounds. The kingdom of God becomes finally and fully realized on earth as it is in heaven. There's worship and King Jesus comes in judgment, not just a judgment of wrath, but also a judgment of reward for his people. The elders are gathered around the throne, sing, and one of the things they say is, the time has come for rewarding your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great. If we know Christ, we will all be raised to life with him one day. And we will be judged and given rewards as we enter into new creation life with him. The only measurement, the only measurement that will be used for our lives in the meeting out of those rewards is the extent to which they were witnesses to the reality of the crucified one. The only measurement is the extent to which our lives were conformed to the great witness, the truth himself incarnate, who was trampled and in trampling triumphed. I find this sobering and confronting, but also something here that's inspired and inspiring. I'm sure you do too. He who has ears to hear, Let him hear in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.